Hello everybody, I hope you are having a fantastic day. I started this video and I was going to apologize for how filthy my mat was, but then I cleaned it somewhat, so you're welcome. Nowhere near as filthy as it was. Uh, it says this is the circuit board area, so I'm going to put the circuit board here. And the circuit board in question is a ColecoVision cartridge. So about a year ago, I had the actual barn find where I found a Coleco Atom in horrific shape. I mean, it had eggs in it and all kinds of just nastiness in that thing. And I've just slowly but surely tinkered with it and I've gotten it back together. But the problem is I don't have any games. And the way I'm going to fix that is with the sponsor of this video, PCBWay. Now, I actually ordered this with my own money uh, from PCBWay.com. And so you can go over there and I bought three different sets of circuit boards and got the whole thing manufactured and delivered to my house for about 40 bucks. In fact, I'll just go ahead and show you. I also got these Commodore uh, disk drive test cartridges. And uh, what was this one? I actually forget what this one is. This is a, uh, oh, it's this is a, a floppy drive emulator for Commodore. All these things came to my house, including shipping for about 40 bucks. And that is absolutely incredible. And so I've talked about it over and over and over again, but PCB way is how I keep all these old machines going. Um, you know, the, these cartridges are not cheap to go buying on eBay. And to be honest, I just want a couple of old games to tinker with on the machine. And so today we are going to actually make my first ColecoVision cartridge. Um, so we'll kind of chat as we, you know, as we do this. I'm not going to do the fast forwarding soldering in the lower corner. There's not a whole lot going on here. First thing we're going to do is we're going to put in a socket for an EEPROM and a socket for a chip I've actually never used before. It's the uh, 74LS21. I got them in a mailbag recently and tested a couple of them. Uh, but we're just going to turn this thing upside down. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, that com or that uh, Coleco was in horrific shape. I had not. Um, I'm relatively new to retro computers. I obviously I'm old, so I lived through this stuff. But um, you know, I had never even heard of the Coleco Atom in all my dealings. Uh, maybe I knew about it as a kid, but I don't think so. Uh, I did have friends, however, with the Coleco Vision. Uh, which is the game system. And so I was always, you know, it's one of those things like in it's, we're so spoiled today with the amount of stuff that we can just go out and buy, um, you know, and we can have access to everything. And at that time, you know, the, the things that you were buying were just, this, this soldering iron is definitely ripping hot. So I don't know why that's must be a ground plane there. Um, you know, at the time, it just wasn't that way. You know, the things that you were buying were a significant portion of your income. I mean, we, you know, we're talking about, you know, when this stuff came out, the minimum wage was only a couple dollars an hour. And so, you know, to go out and buy, um, you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollar console and then games that were back then, I mean, they were 30 and $40 a game. I mean, you were talking, you know, you were talking days wages to multiple days wages to buy, uh, you know, this kind of stuff. It wasn't just something that you could get readily available. So, um, you know, we were an Atari family. I was very, very fortunate to have an Atari uh, 2600 growing up. But, you know, I had other friends that had things like Intellivisions and ColecoVisions and all that stuff. And so, you know, they had different games. And to me, like, I didn't necessarily think that one was better than the other, but they just had stuff that I didn't have access to. And so I always thought that was kind of cool. Um, and so there were games that I played on the Coleco that you weren't going to play on the Atari. And I mean, let's be honest, the Atari 2600, the graphics and stuff were garbage. And I do think the Coleco was a step up. Um, now, one of the cool things about this Coleco Atom, the system itself failed spectacularly, but it was basically an 8-bit computer with a ColecoVision game console, like, I mean, an actual, like, PCB, separate PCB, uh, strapped to the thing. And so you could turn the thing on and you could, um, boot it either in Coleco Atom mode or you could boot it as a, uh, you know, as a, as a ColecoVision game console. And so, um, there's actually been a resurgence in the last couple years about these machines and people have been fixing them and building just stupid, awesome amounts of add-ons for them and stuff. Most of them aren't open source. Um, it is kind of a weird thing. It seems like, you know, the Atari stuff, a lot of it winds up getting open source. The ColecoVision doesn't seem to be as much. I mean, there's a power supply, there's some other things, but nothing, you know, not tons of them are open source, but 
that said, there's a huge resurgence on it. One thing that is open source is something called the FujiNet. And uh, I've done one video, I think, about it for the Atari 8-bit uh, computers. And I do have one for this computer that I'll be playing with eventually. But this video is about the ColecoVision and its cartridge. Um, so we're just going to go ahead and keep soldering this on. Uh, I love this kind of stuff because, you know, sometimes you can turn these things into diagnostic cartridges. You can... Uh, you know, you can play games on them, and, and these PCBs are so cheap, they're, you know, wind up being like five bucks for 10 of them. And, you know, like I said, I got three things delivered, and it wound up being 40 bucks for 30 PCBs. So that's, you know, that's really awesome. So that puts the cost of this thing right at about $1.30 for this. And then the other parts are really cheap. I mean, you're talking, you know, fractions of a dollar for the LS21 chips and way under a dollar for the EEPROMs. So all of a sudden you've got yourself a pretty nice um, thing. So, and just to show you here, we've got a bunch of these LS21 uh, chips, LS, uh, SN74 LS21 N to be more specific. And then these EEPROMs are just so plentiful. These are the standard uh, Atmel 8K EEPROMs. So um, essentially, there's not much else going on here. I wouldn't be surprised if it'd be a good idea to add something like a 100 nanofarad capacitor to this thing, uh, just as a little bit of smoothing and protection. But for the most part, I think that's all you got to do. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to test one of these chips over on the computer, and then I'm going to uh, burn a game to an EEPROM, and we're going to hook up the Coleco Atom. Alrighty then, we are over at one of my favorite places, which is the EEPROM programmer. And uh, I'm going to link to this one in the description or one very similar. And this is just one of the most versatile tools out there. It's a little bit of an investment at 50 or 60 bucks, but I use it nonstop. And one of the first things we're going to do with it is we're going to go in here to the logic test. And we're going to type in 7421. And we're going to see that this is the uh, 7421 chip that we were just talking about. And I'm going to hit test. And I can hit it over and over and over again. And I'm going to find out that for the most part, we believe that this chip is good. Uh, so in the event that, you know, I get this thing fired up and it doesn't work, I have pretty decent reason to believe that that chip actually works. All right. I have no idea what I was thinking when I was uh, originally filming that part because I forgot this is definitely a 32K cartridge. So we need a, a 27C64. Uh, sorry, it's T256. Try that again, see if 256, the ones I have are by ST. At least I think they're by ST. There's a chance that they've been rebranded, and if they are, I'll change that before I program it. And then what you need to do is you need to find a 32K ROM for your cartridge and load it up. So I have Donkey Kong here, which I think is actually a more modern game by the 2005 date on it. But uh, we're going to go ahead and fire that up, and we're going to hit program. And program. And see, we got a problem, and it's telling us that it's an 8F04. Now, this is the dumb thing. I don't really understand why the people at AliExpress would rebrand these chips, because uh, I think they work, but um, they basically just changed the brand name on them. So what I have, I think this originally came from Control Alt Reese, who got it from somebody else, but uh, I have a list of all these manufacturer IDs. So this is a 8F04, so we're going to come over here to my Google Drive EEPROM list, and I'm just going to type in uh, Control F. 8F, and then you can see 8F04 is by a company called Fairchild, and the real name on this chip is an FM27C256. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to go back here, and we're going to select that, and that's Fairchild 256. And now I'll bet I'm going to have to reload the file, and then I'm going to guess that this thing's just going to program. And we're going to hit program, and program. And there you go. You can see, uh, again, so all they did was make this thing more annoying i would have been perfectly fine buying fairchild brand eproms i didn't need st brand but they thought maybe they could add a penny or two to value and so they rebranded them and that kind of sucks all right and while i'm over here at the computer i'm going to mention one more thing uh this is a 32k chip and i mentioned that uh this rom here is 32k that i loaded in but uh we also want to be able to possibly use some smaller ROMs on here. So I'm going to show you a little trick for that. I've got a little program here called Bin Wizard, and uh, it crashes every time I save, but it actually does save. Uh, what you can do is you can tell it what size you're working with, and we've got a, a uh, 27C256, and we can add multiple files on here, and we can actually merge them together. 
So let's say we have a game like Burger Time that is uh, 16 kilobytes instead of 32. What we can actually do is add that same game in here multiple times. Now you can't actually mix multiple games and make your own multi cartridge thing, but what you can do is add it there. Now you see that you have zero free space and you can merge them together and I can create a single file called Burger Time 32K. So what you'll then see is if I come over here and I hit load and browse, um, I've got this Donkey Kong file that's 32K and I have Burger Time 32K. So I can click on that and load that. And hopefully if all goes well this time, it will actually program. Uh, yep, and we still have that 8F04. So this is another rebranded chip. And we're gonna go ahead and program that and hopefully all will be well. All right, so just to give you a little peek behind the curtain, um, this is where I normally have my uh, retro games on. But since I'm recording, I've got my old Acer Swift laptop there that'll be doing the recording. This is the Coleco Atom that was uh, in horrific shape and it's in a lot better shape. Um, I don't have the power supply for it because it was in a printer that I just wound up gutting because it was terrible. Um, so I did make my own little ATX adapter so that I can use it on an ATX power supply that has negative 5 volts. And here are two cartridges. Um, I did have an issue with the uh, whatever the first one I made was that weird 2005 game. But I've got a Chuck Norris game and a uh, there's that Burger Time. And I don't think I, I haven't played either one of them. Uh, so yeah, so let's go ahead and get this into a position where I can fire it up and we're going to see if this and the joysticks and all that work. Oh yeah, speaking of the joysticks, I've got the joystick over here. Um, it originally came with a white one. I don't have it. Um, this is another one, never tested it. So we'll see. All right. I will 3d print, um, enclosures for these things eventually. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to stick my finger in here and, uh, just try to get this cartridge centered and push down, adds a little bit of pressure to it. I'm guessing that will be fine. I'm going to hit capture. Now I don't even have sound hooked up right now, but I'm gonna hit capture there. And I'm gonna turn it on and let's see what happens. All right, I found another joystick here. Um, looks about the same, but we'll see if this one works. So we're gonna load here. I'm definitely gonna try speed one because I suck at gaming. Uh, I don't have to push anything. Again, never owned a Coleco, don't know what to do. Um, okay, so press one for skill. All right, that's better. At least that one worked. Now the question is, can I go left and right and up and down? All right, I can go up, I can go down, I can go left. Oh, that fell. Uh, can I go up? Uh, I don't even know if I can go right yet because I already died. Um, let's try see if I can go uh, right again. Yeah, all the directions work. Everything, everything is functional. Uh, so that is awesome. We have successfully built a Coleco cartridge and I have successfully tested my joystick. But uh, I appreciate you guys watching. I appreciate PCBWay for sponsoring this video. And uh, I am so happy to have a function in Coleco. Now I just got to figure out what to do with it.